Always there for the example. That's why we keep you around. No, uh, yeah, so please do try to catch your seat <laughs> as you get up, if possible. And uh, all right, so this session is going to be on uh, a comprehensive overview of the latest and greatest of analytics plus on web as well as Android. Uh, this will be by uh, Nancy and I. And you would have seen on, what's today, Tuesday, Monday, that there is a lot of new analytics functionalities on the web. And we're trying to make sure that those analytics functionalities are also replicated, reflected on Android as much as possible. Because we know that there is a single end user here. There is an end user that is using both the Android device to capture. And in an ideal world, they're also potentially using that same Android device for analysis. When that, who's that end user? We can think about, say, facility in charges, um, outreach workers, uh, maybe even district health officers if they have some responsibility. Of course, you have lots of other programs where you may have a user who is doing both data entry and data analysis. I think ideally, we're all hoping that we can empower more data analysis at lower levels, right? We want the people who are closest to the action, who are actually in, do, performing the interventions, to be informed by data. We want more decentralized data uh, uh, use and decision making. And so a big part of that is understanding what are the data analysis needs, making sure that those are available on the web, and then also putting it more directly in the palm of their hand uh, and having that same data analysis being supported on the Android device as well. Okay, so what are we gonna do? How do I move my slides? Go, click, help. I think I made it, I think I got it set up for you and then you just came in for, came in for the win. Just cherry picking it next to the goal. All right, so the goals for this session are first to highlight the functionalities on the web and Android analytics. This is the first time I've ever done this. Uh, honestly, this is the first time that I've even ever done this is look side by side. Here's what we have on the web and here's what we have on the analytics. I think you guys have, on the uh, Android team have been doing it a bit more than we have. But again, we're trying to have continuity here. We're having, trying to have as much feature parity as we possibly can. We're also going to demonstrate how do we make analytics on the web first and then put them onto the Android device um, in the app. And we're gonna, of course, illustrate the gaps because there are gaps, we don't have feature parity. So if you're making analytics on the web that you want people to use on their phones, you need to know what you can do on the web that will show up on the phones, okay? All right, so I'm just gonna do a quick run through of the analytics functionalities as a, as a refresher for you. The latest functionalities, this is not just from the most recent 41 release, this is also going and looking back at the 40 and, and 39 releases as well. So I'm just gonna do all of this with a demo because I'm feeling brave and I didn't prepare slides. Share, stop sharing. Can I move this over here? Or should I move this? Okay. Mm-hmm. 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 Nice. All right. I'm going to go in a little bit reverse order here, and I'm going to start with the Maps app. So by a show of hands, who here is actively using the Maps app in your analysis? Don't be shy about it. Okay. Some people, not everybody, which is kind of alarming because it is, honestly, it is probably the most advanced analytics app we have at the moment. It's, uh, and it's also the place where we can add the functionality that you need the fastest. So... You're not using the Maps app, shame on you. Let me get into a couple of the best functionalities of the Maps app, why it's much more powerful now. So of those who are using the Maps app, how many of you have connected it to the Google Earth engine? Yeah, a few, you're not sure? Trying, okay. If you're struggling with it, please come talk to me, all right? And we can get that set up. Um, 
what we have right now is a, a, a pretty incredible cooperation with Google Earth Engine to be able to pull in, quite honestly, potentially hundreds of different data sets through Google Earth Engine. Those data sets are coming from all kinds of sources. So we have data coming from uh, uh, WorldPop. We have data coming in from Facebook. There's data coming in from uh, NASA. Uh, yeah, just lots and lots and lots of different uh, useful data sources. I'm going to illustrate just a few of those that we've, because of their very broad generic utility, we've embedded into the Maps app already. The first one is population age groups. So this population layer is coming from uh, WorldPop, which is an organization that does population estimates. Many countries are struggling with population denominators. In fact, I'd say most DHIS2 countries are struggling with their population denominators. Um, WorldPop is a source for not a household census, but an alternative denominator based upon a lot of other corresponding data that can give you better population estimates than what many countries have. Um, the WorldPop projections, not to get into like a methodology a discussion, but have been shown to be more accurate than most countries' own population projections. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a population layer. And let's say I want to see population of children under, uh, under five by health facility catchment area. Well, this is extremely easy now. This is something that all of you can do if you're using DHIS 2.38 or newer, which is the vast majority of you, hopefully. If you're, if you're not using 38 or newer, then you really need to upgrade. Well, come on, Jill. All right, so I'm so you can see here, I have all of my population disaggregations, zero to one, one to four, so on and so forth for both male and female. And then I'm going to, I can look at the sum and the mean. The mean is an average per hectare. So probably not super useful for a lot of folks. I'm just going to turn that one off. I'm going to turn on the population. For Sierra Leone, the last time that we have data for the population protections was 2020, so a little out of date, but probably more recent than their last census. Um, and then I'm going to choose, uh, not district, I'm going to go down to facility, and then I'm going to choose use associated geometries. This is where we're going to do our catchment areas. How many of you have integrated catchment areas into your... How do you know what populations your health facilities are serving? You don't? Is it, has, seriously, I'm actually asking, has anyone done this? because it's been out for about two years. Okay, you do have separate catchment population data, okay. So the catchment areas, I'll just go ahead and turn it on and then talk about it while it loads. The catchment areas are provided here uh, from an organization called Crosscut. DHIS2 does not have native functionality to generate catchment areas, but many health programs require catchment areas. You have to have an idea of, hopefully this is loading, Spinning, spinning, spinning. You have to have a pretty good idea of what is your population, what is your geographic area at which people are coming to a health facility. Okay, this is taking too long. Oh, here it comes, just as I said. And here comes the population layer. So you see each one of these represents a catchment area. How are the catchment areas developed? Again, they're coming from an org organization called Crosscut. And they are able, Crosscut is able to generate catchment areas based upon um, any number of factors. So travel time, uh, land cover, uh, road quality, um, geographic features, bridges, rivers, mountain streams, that kind of stuff. Um, and so they automatically generate a catchment area. Uh, and then they give you the added flexibility in their DHIS2 application to go in and manually edit it, right? So this first round is kind of a best guess. And then if you see, if you're actually implementing this, you can go in and edit yourself. So here we have catchment areas and you can see, I'm just gonna zoom in on one of these here. And you can see that as I zoom in, I'm seeing the heat map for population. Oh, I picked the health facility with the longest, most difficult name randomly. Okay, anyways, so this health facility, you can see where the people are in the population. Uh, and I can see that of under five children, 
they have a population of, you know, projected population of 4,394. So again, this is generic functionality. This is not specific to Sierra Leone. Every country can do this today if you're using 38 or newer. Uh, you don't have to add anything to your DHIS2 instance other than sending it, uh, uh, using the CrossCut app to generate your catchment areas. If you need more information, we're also bringing in building footprints layer. So if you're doing campaigns where you need to go door to door, um, or you need to do outreach areas where you want to make sure your outreach site is somehow located next to where people are actually living, then you can build in, bring in the uh, the building footprints layer. This is actually coming uh, from Facebook with inputs from NASA, USGS, and uh, all through the Google Earth Engine. So I can add this layer as well. And take a second to load. Let's zoom into a different facility here now. So you can see the orange is coming. These are buildings. Let's just hide our maps. And so you can see I can zoom into a uh, an area and then each, you know, outlines of all the buildings. And of course, I can overlay this with my population. So I can get, you know, see if the, the population corresponds to the, the buildings. I can also figure out population uh, or buildings per number of buildings per catchment area. And I just want to point out that the catchment areas are not necessarily just for health facilities. You could have catchment areas for anything. You could have a catchment area for schools. You can have catchment areas for uh, case investigation areas, foci, um, whatever it is that you like. Boreholes, common one. So, uh, so yeah, so we can figure out buildings per catchment area. This is uh, a little sluggish right now. And again, generic functionality. So. That's it on the Maps app uh, that I wanted to demonstrate. Now I'm going to jump over to the um, Data Visualizer app. All right. So what I'm going to do in the Data Visualizer app is kind of changing pages a bit here. I'm going to go over some of the latest functionality that we have for data quality analysis. I illustrated some of this um, uh, in my presentation yesterday, but I also wanted to point to um, one of the chart types that is very powerful for data quality, but not being very much used. So I'm going to do a scatter plot. Who here is doing using the scatter plots for outlier detection or data quality analysis? Has anyone done this yet? You guys didn't realize this was going to be a name and shame kind of presentation, did you? This, I mean, it's honestly, it's kind of disappointing to hear because it's been out for a couple of years, and it is probably one of the more powerful data quality functionalities we have in DHIS2. So what I'm going to do is just turn on, um, make a quick scatter plot here. I'm going to put ANC first visits in my vertical axis, ANC second visits, because, of course, there's always a relationship between ANC1 and ANC2. When you're making a scatter plot, you want to see um, use um, related variables. And you see, I've got one big spot up here. This is Sierra Leone, of course, so I haven't changed my org units. I'm going to change those and turn on all of the facilities. All right. So, a very basic scatter plot. Here you have each dot represents a health facility. I'm going to go to my options, I'm going to go to outlier. And then we have, see, an outlier tab here. I can choose outlier analysis. And then we present to you three different outlier methodologies. Now, you don't have to be a statistician um, to know which ones to use. We, our default is interquartile range. Interquartile range, according to all of the statisticians that we talk to, is one of the more robust ways of, detecting, of doing outlier detection based upon normally distributed data. We're not necessarily talking about seasonal data here. We're talking about normally distributed data. Um, we also have Z-score, standard score, if you're more familiar with that, and then modified Z-score. Of course, just to point out that Z-score is the least statistically robust way of doing it, we recommend interquartile range or modified Z-score. I am just going to leave interquartile range here. Quick update, and you can see what it's done. It's applied a 
uh, a, um, a median. And then I have kind of my acceptable thresholds for the relationship. So you can see everything that is in the, in fact, I can zoom in. I can drag and hold a window, bring it in. So you can see every health facility here is a green dot. The ones that are considered outliers, statistically speaking, are red dots. If I reset my zoom, I can go back up here and say, let's just look at a really bad one. So this one up here, Gondama Community Health Center, I guess that is. So they reported 4,681 ANC1 visits, but only 1,780 ANC2 visits. Is that wrong data? Well, it could be accurate. I mean, of course, we are with ANC one and two. We are technically talking about two different cohorts, but it is extremely unusual, right? It's so unusual that it's statistically improbable, and so it's definitely worth a follow up. Now, you can see this one out here. This one's even UMC Urban Health Center Hospital. They reported only one thousand four hundred ANC one, but six thousand two hundred eighty-eight ANC two. That's extremely unlikely. Right. Um, so one of those values is probably incorrect, probably poor data quality. Now, the next question is, of these outliers, which one is throwing off your, your, your key impact indicators at a national level? Some of these outliers may be so big that they're actually influencing your, 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 your national level impact indicators. How do we do that? Well, if we go back to outliers, we can turn on extreme lines. And I'm going to leave it at 1%. And what it's going to do is it's going to put a line at 1% of the total national values for ANC1 and ANC2, my, my vertical and horizontal axis. So you can see that anything that is above this line or further out than this line is an outlier that is so big that it's throwing off your um, national statistics at, a, at an aggregated national level, at least by 1%. Does that make sense? Are you guys going to use it? Are you excited about it? You're like, oh, wow, that's something we can use now. And, uh, you know, and just to reiterate, data quality, it, you, got, you have data quality issues. We all have data quality issues. It's a fact of life. And so we're trying to build as many of the tools just in the data visualizer application that allows you to capture those. Um, so you can save this, of course, and you can put it on a dashboard. And as new data comes in, it'll automatically update. You'll see where the outliers are. Um, and uh, yeah. The other one that I wanted to just repeat myself, but it's always good to repeat yourself, is the new outliers table. So if you didn't believe the scatter plot, you can just switch over to the outliers table here and have DHIS2 automatically calculate a list of outliers for you across as many data elements as you want, as many org units as you want, uh, for any period that you want. And we've actually we've actually created a new backend for this that's highly uh, optimized for performance. So you can actually throw a ton of data into this and it should spit it out pretty quickly. Um, now, what is the difference a little bit between the outliers that you see here and the outliers that you, uh, in fact, actually remember that one, the, the UMC that we were talking about in the, in the, uh, as the outlier? Here is, is actually telling us, right? So it was second ANC visit in November and it was saying that the outlier was actually in, um, in the fixed say, ANC uh, second visit, it reported again 1,669, but the average or the median, excuse me, is 749. So here we saw the outlier in the scatter plot, and now it's also we're seeing it again in the outlier table. Okay. The big difference is if you want to know the math behind it, is again in the scatter plot, you're comparing two different variables. In this outlier detection, you're actually comparing one variable um, against itself, its historical um, average or median in this case. And what's the sample size? Your statisticians are wondering. It's all the data that's ever been recorded for that variable, for that org unit, okay? So it's actually a very robust measurement because you're basically taking any data that's available, okay? All right, now, just to highlight a couple of more things before I hand it off. Of course, we have all of our normal um, charts and stuff. I wanted to uh, illustrate one of the 
functionalities that we added. So when we talk to countries, most times the feedback that we get is we want the dashboards to be prettier. And I'm saying it like that's exactly what they tell us. They're like, the dashboard needs to look pretty or make the dashboard look nicer, which is extremely unspecific and not terribly helpful feedback, generally, just letting you know. <laughs> but it means usually, once you start to get into it, we want more color metric indicators. We want more legends. We want things to be cluing me into performance more clearly. We want to know if things are getting better or worse more clearly. Okay. And what we have discovered or what we've uh, appreciated over the last couple of years is the single value chart type. And I'll just show you, turn on A and C coverage, which is <laughs> way too high. Um, maybe I'll change the period here and just look at last month. That's even worse. <laughs> well, uh, the single value chart type has become probably the most popular chart type. Uh, you see it not just in DHS2 dashboards, you see it in, in a lot of dashboards. Uh, various, you know, most, most dashboards these days that you're seeing are, are, are covered in single value. And the reason is because, I mean, right quick at a glance, everybody can see exactly what it is. It's very clear. Um, and so in our quest to help you make your dashboards prettier, we also added legends to these. And so I can say, use the legend for the chart um, color. And of course I can, um, uh, I have various options here. So you can say I can use a predefined legend. So you remember you can apply a legend to a indicator or data element in DHIS2, so it's always available. You can also select your own legend too. Uh, legends, if you're not familiar, are made in the maintenance app by a system admin. Users can't just make their own legends on the fly. Quick update, and now you see it. This is a terrible example because this percentage is ridiculous. Um, maybe I should just change the org unit. Thanks, Kim. I just want to point out, this is better, that we made this feature because Kim harassed me for like two years. You do want them pretty, and we, made th we make them pretty for Kim, and as well as the rest of the world, mostly Kim. So, uh, so yeah, so you can see that the chart, the background is autom automatically updated. And again, I can save this, I can put it on a dashboard, I can make it as big as I want, and then I can have a bunch of these in a row where they're coming down columns um, to communicate these, these, uh, these indicators as, as easily as want. So last thing that I wanna demo before I hand it off to um, Nancy is one of the requests that we had for, we keep getting for a long time is make DHIS2 more like Excel, um, which is fine. Um, more or less. Then when you start digging into it, right? It's like we can't turn DHIS2 into Excel. <laughs> um, but when you start digging into it, you find out what people want is more often than not, they want the flexibility of doing custom calculations that Excel gives you, right? What we find in DHIS2 is there's a lot of users at lower levels, district, uh, facility level, and they don't have admin credentials to make new indicators. Right, they don't actually have the. Uh, you know, you're all familiar that an indicator has to be made in the maintenance app by a system administrator with a very high level of permissions. A lot of folks at lower levels they want to see some calculations, but they don't have the same authority and permissions to actually make new indicators. So they're downloading to Excel, doing the calculations into Excel, and then they're coming up and asking us, "Can you just make it more like Excel because Excel is what worked for me?" Right. Well, when you start kind of following the logic back, you realize that they, people want more custom calculations. Um, so I'm gonna just turn on districts. Hopefully, oh, I only have two. Let me just turn these off, turn that on. All right. So now I have all of my um, uh, ANC first visits. I have all of my ANC visits. And say I want Bumbus to make a, I don't know, a, a sum of a, all ANC visits. Um, 
I mean, actually, that's not a good one because I could just put on row and column totals. <laughs> um, what's a better example? Coverage, maybe? Let's see, A and C first visits and... Uh, um, expected pregnancies okay so let's just say we have our, our number of pregnancies and we have our number of a and c one visits what if i want to do a simple coverage indicator so i can go to data and then we have this button here called add custom calculations has anyone used this yet this is 39 no one's used this this is a you tested it. This is a real bummer. Did you know about it? Who knew about this? Okay. She didn't use it. All right. All right. <laughs> Let me just walk you through this real quick. So what I can do here is build in any kind of custom calculations based on any of the data, data elements that I have access to. So I can say, uh, I can just double click. I can see it's coming over here, my expression builder right here. I can say A and C one divided by, double click my division symbol, um, and I'll go expected pregnancies. And this doesn't quite make sense because I need some, I need to put in some brackets here. So I'll put that here, drag it over, put it. Put a close parentheses and then let's just times it by 100. Hit my number. And I got to give a name. Save my calculation. Oh, you also see that it uh, checked it. And so now you see I have my ANC1 coverage calculation here. I can add that and it's calculator right there for me. You, okay. I mean, it's been there for a minute, but I'm better late than never, I guess. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, well, um, yeah, I can. So I could. Yeah, there we go. So the question is, can I plot it? And yeah, so it's tied to the data dimension, so I can do anything I want with it. Uh, in terms of charts. So I could say, uh, what's a good one here? Maybe a line. Actually, that doesn't really make sense because we're um, looking across org units. Let's change this from last month to last 12 months. Click update. Let's go with my org units in category update. So now we're looking at a line across the last 12 months. Options, axes. Um, go to my series. Let's put this one on axes two because it's a percentage against we're looking at total counts. All right, there we go. So now we can see pregnancies, uh, ANC1, and then on my second axis here, I have ANC1 coverage, what I just calculated. Okay. All right. What else? Kim, Caroline, anybody else? What? That was a real quick latest and greatest. Okay. So, and then of course, we have all of our, we, you know, other than that, we've made small changes and improvements here and there. We've, we've uh, made some improvements on how you build the dashboards. We've added some additional functionality for uh, um, chart types. I also need to show the line listing app again. Just, I did it earlier, but just to reiterate. So the line listing app now has support for event line listing, enrollment line listing, and tried entity line list. If you missed the demo on Monday, I'll just go through it again very quickly uh, before handing it off. Um, the first one I'm going to do is look at a person. You can see the line listing app if you're using it. Who was who uses the line listing app, by the way? 
Oh yeah, a few hands. Kim, you don't count. Okay, a few people. That's good. If you're using the older version of the line listing app, which I assume you probably are since this was released last week, um, you can see that this actually looks a little bit different. We have optimized this user experience to facilitate these uh, cross-program tracked entity line lists. As a previously, it was more optimized for just event and enrollment. So we've tried to find a happy middle ground with user experience here. But you can see once I've turned on my tracked entity, all of my dimensions on the left panel automatically update to reflect um, the dimension or the tracked entity type that I have selected. So you see now I have my person dimensions. Uh, and these are all the attributes associated with a person tracked entity. So coming from any program. So I'm going to turn on just a couple of these. And then I'm going to go to my program dimensions. And in this drop down, you see I have access to all of the programs that that tracked entity is enrolled in. Or actually, not even just enrolled in, that is associated with this tracked entity. Okay. So I can go to track of program one. I'm going to turn on an enrollment date. I'm going to say last 12 months. And then you can see that I have all of my data elements and data items that are associated with this program. I'm going to turn on just a couple. And you can see how quickly, how easy it is to turn on the data items, just clicking the plus arrow. I'm going to go to program two, do the same thing. I'm going to turn on my enrollment date, cross program. Hopefully this works. It worked on Monday. Yeah. Well, actually, didn't work great. <laughs> um, where did I go wrong? But anyways, what we're actually seeing here is a list of all tracked entities. And we're seeing that of these tracked entities, none of them actually have data recorded for either of these two programs. See that? So this kind of shaded out area is indicating that there was no data recorded. Okay. But I guess I probably uh, deviated from my happy path from Monday somewhere. But for the sake of time, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, and then hand over to Nancy, who's going to do a much more professional, less ad hoc presentation than me. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight, uh, um, Caroline and I are part of the functional design team here. I just want to highlight how hard that the analytics team has been really working with these new features to think of users in mind and to help the transition process. There, are this, as you know, might know, this app went through a lot of users. It went through some user testing and we got some user feedback to get these final um, designs. However, one of the things that we've also noticed um, is the uptake and the transition of new apps and features. So that's one thing that we're trying to do as a team to create uh, uh, some transition apps with the communications teams that are developing it. And there is a transition kit um, that has been developed for the new line listing app. So it gives short videos um, of features to look for. It shows the difference between the old app and the new app. And this is one of our initiatives to help improve a user uptake um, and so that you know what the features are. The other component we have with this line listing app is that um, we have yes. with the new functionality for the cross program line listing, we have a um, a demo set up that's open for 14 days and uh, with some small scenarios and a user feedback form. So I, if anyone in this room would like to um, test out and play with the new functionality, this is one of the initiatives that we're taking as a team. Um, so we will link that to the presentation, um, that scenario and also the line listing uh, kit. And on Thursday, they'll go deeper into uh, what's in this transition kit, just so um, we can you can use the features that are there. So thank yeah. you, Scott. Yeah.
No, thanks for the functional analysis team really telling us uh, a, a very clear voice from the user community. And just as to, just to reiterate, and as you kind of have illustrated here, we see very slow adoption of our new functionalities. Um, and it's usually maybe two or even three years after we have released a functionality that we start to receive feedback on it. That cycle is far too slow. We need more immediate feedback, uh, as much of it as possible. Um, because two to three years later, that feedback is probably already even antiquated, right? Um, and it's a, it's a real problem that we have. So if you are able to test out newer versions of DHIS2, even not necessarily in production, but just stand them up and test them for us and give us that immediate feedback is invaluable to us. Um, yeah. And that also to be said is because the adoption is so slow, I'd say maybe at this point, the majority of requests that we get are for functionalities we've already developed. So please do also read the release notes <laughs> and make sure that you're not asking for something that already exists. And if you are, then it's, you know, it's fine. We'll just point you to the release notes. Hello. Okay. So thank you, Scott. Now we are going to talk about the Android analytics, uh, which they basically has a different use. I mean, it's analytics as well, uh, but we are going to um, trying to focus that on the data entry part. How are they useful when the user is trying to enter information in the daily basis? So I wanted to start with the general knowledge of visualizations, that's how we call them. So it's the given name uh, for any chart, uh, column, bar, line, radar. Uh, I'm going to show you later which ones we already support or line listing tables. Uh, we calculate it locally with the data available in the device. So that means they are like instant analytics. So you can see them when you are creating more information. That means that in, if in your device you're not using or you're not having any data, then you won't be able to use them. It's not like the dashboard that Scott just uh, showed us. Uh, it's a chart or it's something that the user can rely on to see if the data that is being entered is okay or if they need to do some changes. Um, so that takes me to the third point, which is their main purpose is to assist the user in the data entry and support the decision making at the lowest level. So if you need a highest level uh, analysis, then you can go back to web and, and use some of the things that Scott just showed us. Um, another thing is that we need to configure them using the Android, the Android settings web app. Uh, so I'm going to show you that in a bit. So before 3.0, we supported the data visualizer analytics. There are some examples there, uh, pivot tables, pie charts, bar charts, line charts. Uh, and from 3.0 that I showed this uh, yesterday as well, we are also supporting line listing. And I'm going to show you uh, some limitations that we have there as well. These are the configuration parameters, some of them overall. Uh, for data visualizer, uh, we use we support the column, line, pipe, pivot table, single value, and radar. And in the line listing, I'm putting visualization type, but, but it's the input type that you can see when you're configuring a line listing table. We support the event and the enrollment inputs. We do not support yet the, the track entity attributes that Scott showed us. For time dimension, we use relative periods for both of them. So this year or past year, past 12 months. Uh, for the data visualizer, there's a row di dimension that is the maximum of two. And for columns in data visualizer, max two. And for line listing, uh, 15. And then for org units, also we use uh, relative org units. This is some steps that I'm going to show in the demo later. But just to summarize, this is some of the steps to configure those uh, charts directly to be used in the phone. So you use the interface of the understanding web app and you mostly do five steps, easy steps. The first one is to select the visualization type. 
in this case can be event or data. Then you select the visualization. Then you add an alternative title because sometimes you can save uh, with a super long name and it won't be looking good in, in Android. And someone was saying we need pretty things. So this is part of it. Then you add it to a visualization group if you want to and you save. Uh, some specific features that we're going to be looking at uh, when I uh, demonstrated on the phone. Uh, for data visualizer and line listing, you can group the charts or the tables. You can have as many groups as you want to and as many charts in the groups as well. There's no limitation. For data visualizer, we have filters. You can filter by period and you can filter by org unit. Something else that you can do uh, with data visualizer charts is that you can change uh, the type of chart within the app, in the app. So if you have, for example, a line listing uh, chart, sorry, a, a line chart, you can change it to a table or you can change it to a bar chart. And for the line listing tables, uh, there is a search fun functionality that I showed yesterday that you can select any of the columns and you can search by it. So I also left some helpful documentation uh, that is in the in the web in our documentation, but it's the is the links for you to get it. So I'm going to be doing the demo in my laptop. So I'm going to change this thing. I can do. Okay. Can you share from there. Okay. You can see, okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so what I'm going to do, uh, just to show you a bit of the process on how to uh, select the chart, change it a bit so you can use it in Android. I'm going to use a chart, for example, I can use this one. Um, so what I need to do is just to make sure that I, I am covering all the limitations that Android has. So in this case, I only has one series, I'm using um, indicators, which is totally fine. And then for organization unit, I just need to make sure I have a relative organization unit, which is the user organization unit, like it is checked here, so it's okay. And then periods, it says this year, I could change it to anything else if I want to, but I think it's fine. Then I need to make sure that it's properly shared. So it's all users, metadata view and edit, that's fine. So now I can go directly to the Android Settings web app, which I'm gonna show you here, is this icon right here. So it's gonna open and you're gonna come to the analytics side and you can check home, programs, or data sets. So for data visualizer, uh, for all the charts in data visualizer, you can add them in any of those screens. What that means that if you open the program, then at the bottom in the navigation bar, you will see an icon for analytics and you can find all the analytics there. Uh, same for data sets and same uh, for the home screen. It depends on where you want to, to locate your chart. If you locate them in one, uh, for example, if I locate it in the home screen, that doesn't mean I cannot locate it in somewhere else, but it won't do it automatically. You need to do it manually through the Android settings web app. For the line list in part, um, we only accept it in home and programs. We don't accept it in data sets. So what I have to do here is add home visualization, visualization type, which is a data visualization. And then I just need to look at it. Uh, nutrition. This one, I can write a different title if I want to. And probably I don't want to use a group because it's only one. And then I add the home visualization and then save it. So let's see if my phone wants to work with us today and show you.
So I need to sync the configuration. Let's see. So in the meantime, uh, if you have any questions, you can sub me and ask. But in the meantime, I'm going to also create a line listing uh, table. As I was saying, uh, we only support the event ones and the enrollment ones. So I'm going to create the event one. For example, I can choose TV program, TV visit, for example. And I can add, I can, since this um, um, user only has one organization unit, then probably I don't want uh, them to see that. So I can use it as a filter. And then I could add uh, some other, uh, there's no program indicators, but we can use attributes like first name, last name, gender, maybe height. I don't know, things you want to see. And then we can choose some of data elements. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is some information there. So we can save it. And then we need to make sure that is properly shared as well. And then it's the same the same process. We go back to the uh, Android settings web app. Let's see. In this case, maybe I want to do it in the in the program instead of the instead of the home screen. So I select the event visualization. I look for the program, which is TV program. And then the TV report. Where is it? Okay, let's see. Did I not save it? Where the what? No, but I think I didn't save it. Oh no, it's there. Okay, let's refresh it here as well. Okay, so it's not appearing, no, no, why? Okay, so. I have a plan B since these things can happen, of course. Um, so I'm going to show you real quick. I already have, as you can see here, I already have some other, um, line listing so it was a different chart but i can show you that in the meantime so if i go to the child program you will see that at the bottom of the screen you have three different icons uh, maps the list and then the analytics so if you open that you will be able to see the full list uh with the different columns that i that i added previously in the line listing configuration and in the three dots then you can search by any of the um, of the parameters. What I wanted to show you is um, probably it's not the best time to show you this, but I will. Um, if I delete the local data, and I go back, and I open the analytics, then I won't be able to see any of the records because. Uh, it is uh, generating them by by when I have information in my device. 
Okay, so I think that's it from my side. I don't know if you have any questions. Okay. Maybe you can go back to the slides. So we are on the Hello. Yeah. So what we're trying to find and explore more are use cases. Usually the use cases and the feedback that we get are quite isolated to Android or web. And so what we're asking for are use cases where you have a user who is going between both or has dependencies of analytics on their uh, phone that have to be made on the web. What we find is that most users who have analytics requirements on their phone are probably also are, are not often also web DHIS2 users. They're like spray operators, community health workers, clinic in charges. They're the lowest level user, right? And they haven't been trained or they don't have the capacity, they don't have a device where they're able to go in on the web and make new analytics, right? Make a new dashboard or view dashboards. Um, and so they don't know or they're not able to just see the, anal the analytics that are available in the, web in the Android because they don't have access to that web part to build it. Make sense? And so what we're trying to do is look for use cases, explore opportunities where we break, start to break down this barrier a bit, where the users who, are de who need to have analysis and analytics on their device are also then able to go to the web and make it, or potentially, who knows, make it on the device or something. Because um, we do appreciate one of the major barriers we have right now is that this is happening in two different places. And while they are kind of harmonizing a bit, that that act of having it in two different places is preventing the adoption uh, and utility in on an Android probably. So what I'm asking for is if you know of use cases, if you have a use case, if you're willing to just explore it with us, please let's talk about it and let's figure out a plan together because no matter how big or small your use case is, we need to explore um, we need to explore this and then start figuring out ways forward to actually start to dismantle these barriers and make sure that anyone who needs an analytics is able to get it. And, and no matter where they're working, Android or on web. Uh, yeah. So we have, we're, we uh, finished a bit early, um, so we can have time for questions, if there are any, related to what we've presented or just whatever you're feeling, preferably DHS2 related. Hi, <clears throat> hi everyone. I'm uh, Amelie from UNESCO, and I I don't work in health. I'm here for the education content, and um, and so when we work in government or with governments, uh, it's nice to have data, of course, but it's better to have official data. And so I just want to check in. Like uh, I think you mentioned it yesterday, but we can import our own uh, layers, like vector layers, so so we can have our official uh, catchment areas, for example. Yes. Because catchment areas typically are like created like internally to government. So uh, if we can do that, that would be awesome. I mean, I'm sure it's possible. But then um, same question related to the uh, population estimates that you use. I mean, I, we work mm -hmm. uh, a lot with uh, the team at World Pop. Mm -hmm. We exchange methodologies. Uh, and actually, we have uh, developed a methodology to project. Uh, I mean, they're going to release soon the next estimates. But anyway, um, but uh, these what, what the added value of World Pop data is not so much the estimates, but rather the kind of specialization of the estimates. Mm -hmm. And so um, can we import also raster data? Um, yeah. yeah. OK, great. <laughs> I, I, yeah. So yeah, great question. So just uh, on, just to reiterate, so um, what the there are a couple, a few different ways you could go about it. Um, the first one is that you could get the catchment areas, 
uh, the associated geometries, and you could import that as well. I just said it as an associated geometry to an existing org unit, right? So an org unit in DHIS2, say it's a facility or school, can have multiple geometries associated with it. So it can have a point, its physical location. It can have a shape that represents its catchment area, right? It can even have different shapes to represent different catchment areas based upon different services that are being provided. So, for example, a health facility that is providing outreach services for HIV care, whereas other, other facilities that are close to it don't provide that service. So its catchment area for HIV care might be bigger than its catchment area, say, for um, maternal and child health or something. Does that make sense? So you can have as many geometries for, a, for, a, for an org unit as you want, um, and you can turn those on. So just as I, uh, where did my, I lost the HIV help. So just as I turned on the catchment areas for that Sierra Leone, you can, that had just one option because that's the only one I uploaded, but you could have a drop down of as many options as you want and then turn those on. Um, yeah. Um, and then to, but if you have more specialized layers, then what I mentioned on Monday was that you, we now support uh, vector and GeoJSON as well as we have raster as well. So you, can well, they're kind of septic, but um, so you can upload those all as external layers, and you can set those as your base layer, or you can just have them available in your layer drop down and turn them on um, when you build any any app. Uh, but if you have unique requirements, would love to talk to you about it because, like I said, the Maps app is probably one of our more advanced apps in terms of like functionality. Um, and it's the place that we can add functionality to probably the quickest. So very happy to talk about edge map cases. We do have to appreciate that the DHIS2 analytics are not necessarily meant, we're not trying to build a replacement for Arc or QGIS, right? But we're trying to make a very simple maps app to, that brings you kind of the majority of users, 80% of what they need. And then that last 20% is gonna be highly specialized functionality that you would have to use in like Arc or Q. All that to be said, in the next session, the present there's a team from Esri here presenting on their uh, ArcGIS connector. So we have much tighter integration with ArcGIS now as well. No, I think I just said everything. Was that okay? You didn't say no? All right. Uh, hello, uh, my, name is, my name is Yusuf uh, from MSF uh, Brussels. So uh, currently we've implemented uh, the tracker for one of the nutrition program. So one of the questions that came from the project is um, for, currently you can filter from uh, the event visualizer uh, by the patient ID, then you can see the data. But what they wanted is more like to have a dashboard than to be able to filter. Uh, by that uh, ID to see different variation between the growth and other indicators in one place. And that uh, actually is a use case for both uh, using the web app and also to use the Android. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, as it currently stands, you are not able to, on the dashboard, you are not able to filter a line list by any dimension that is not a standard dimension for the analytics. So that's kind of the when, where, and the what, the period, the org unit, and the and the data. Um, uh, so that means that you're not able to filter by an individual patient ID on the dashboard. Has it been requested yet? So it could be the first time, you know, something we could work on. Uh, but as it currently stands, we can't do that. But I think it's a it makes sense, right? Um, but that being said, you can do it, of course, in the cap in the working list, in the capture app itself. So you can filter there. Um, you can also filter the line list in the data visualizer by an individual patient ID, but not once you've added it to the dashboard. Yeah. So not currently there, but could be something that we work on. Jill? Thanks, Scott and Nancy. Um, quick question on the catchment area maps. We work with Crosscut, but are not currently integrating the catchment areas directly into our 
DHIS2, um, partly because we've struggled. We do not have our formal OU hierarchy aligning to like what that operational point is. Mm -hmm. But for the catchment layers that you are showing, do they do, do those catchment areas have to be associated with a formal OU in your hierarchy? Or can you have it as like a base layer that yeah. might be less powerful, but at least is there in the background if you're not able to directly connect that geometry to a specific OU? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, what I think that you should, so the catchment area, as I presented as an alternative geometry, has to be associated with an org unit, as I presented it there, right? But with the added flexibility of importing vector layers, GeoJSON, you can make a, another layer that is catchment areas of, say, your spray operation areas. And Jill works on indoor residual spraying, for the record. That's what I said. say. Um, your spray operation areas that is another layer that just sits on top and is not associated with any of the geometry or org units within DHIS2. Okay. That's that's fine. And, as, and, 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 and now it's much more dynamic as well. So you can click on them and you can explore any kind of a data associated with them and that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. Which is cool. Mm -hmm. And, you know, honestly, as we made that feature, feature, I was kind of thinking about your use case. Yeah. A lot. That's also why we're exploring having geometry associated with OUGs. As yeah. Well, which would I be mean, awesome. Ultimately, that would be the best, yeah. but with the vector layers, you're, you have a lot more flexibility now. Okay. And just in terms of the local Android analytics, we've struggled... Again, it's a spray use case. I think we have we could have an interesting combined web Android analytics use case to explore. We have a lot of entomologists using Android for data collection, and of course, are also referencing the dashboard. So there could be some interesting overlap to explore there. But for our you know Android specific users, we have spray teams that are out. They tend to have really high, I mean, by really high, I mean like district level OU access. We've got several layers down and are capturing data at maybe a village level. And we've really struggled to get the OU dimension into our Android local analytics so that on a day-by-day -day basis, we're not only appreciating how many total events maybe have been collected and representing our spray data, but seeing specific villages by day that somebody has visited. And so would love to maybe pick your brain to see if that's possible, if there's a way that maybe we're missing how to take advantage of the local yeah. Android analytics. Sure. Yeah. Sounds great. Any other questions? Well, it looks like we're kind of struggling with post-lunch drearies and maybe some jet lag. So there should be coffee outside. We can do some jumping jacks. We can do some energizers. If there are no other questions, then I think we can call it, but we'll, oh yeah, sorry, there's a question here. Yeah. Can uh, somebody someone translate, translate from yeah. French? Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. All right. Did you want to hold this? And you, you ask in French and I repeat in English. Okay. okay yes. Uh, c'est Pacifique de Burundi. Uh, je me demande une question à rapport de uh, application Android à DHSD. Uh, on n'a pas encore utilisé ce type uh, de recueil de données ou de visualisation en mode de Android. Mais nous, nous aimerions beaucoup utiliser, explorer uh, ce modèle. Est-ce que faut, uh, pouvons nous utiliser uh, ce modèle pour des formulaires un peu plus rares qui a comme dix colonnes et dix lignes. Uh, ma deuxième question. Uh, en téléchargeant les données, mais je ne pense, pense pas que c'est le bon moment de poser cette question, vous allez m'excuser. Quand on télécharge les données via les data visualiser, uh, on trouve que uh, le nombre de lignes et le nombre de colonnes sont souvent 
limité par rapport euh, de son moins nombre que les lignes qu'on trouve avec Excel. Mm. Oui, est-ce que c'était problématique euh, les... un jour la solution pour avoir plus de lignes et plus de colonnes? Ça, c'est sur le web, sur le web ou sur Android? Ah. Ah. La deuxième question, c'est sur le web ou c'est sur Android? La deuxième question, c'est pour le... cette question générale. Mais sur... pour... Yeah. 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 Yeah or to see actually on the, the interface uh, is a bit challenging. So that's why they prefer sometimes using Excel, um, just be, be, to kind of navigate the tables. Um, but he said also that this might not be the best forum to ask this question. So perhaps uh, he's uh, also available to discuss at the, at the break. Thank you. Yeah, we do have, um, there are some limitations, of course. Um, with DHIS2 on our, um, in, in the analytics on the pivot tables and the line listing, uh, the we in the pivot tables we have something called dynamic rendering. So as you if you make a giant pivot table, say you turn on all of your data, you shouldn't, but you can. Uh, and um, DHIS two will load as you scroll. Right, we're not we're only loading what you see, and that so that's for performance purposes. On the line listing app, uh, you can turn on as much data, but what we we implement a thing called paging, where we only show you a certain number. Uh, I think it's like a hundred rows per page. And then you got to go through the pages, right? Um, I, we appreciate that the paging is not ideal, but we have to, performance is kind of our our, uh, our biggest concern. And it becomes very, very, the line listing app kind of almost makes it too easy to turn on too much data. And then you're asking for a really big query from the database that could really slow things down and, and, and cripple the, the use of DHIS2, not just for you, but for everyone else who's trying to access DHIS2 at the same time. Uh, so that's why we've implemented paging. Um, that being said, uh, well, yeah, I mean, actually with, with downloading to Excel, one of the biggest problems that we have now is that ex the Excel file becomes too big for Excel. So you build it in DHIS2, then you download it to Excel, and then Excel actually has a limit. It's like 64,000 rows or something like that. Yeah, okay, maybe it's a bit bigger. <laughs> but, but you know, they're like, well, it won't download to Excel. Well, that's because you just turned on, like, way too much data in DHIS2. And a DHIS2 can process it, but Excel is struggling. And, and, but we can, we can come back to it, yeah. Nancy, did you have anything you want to add? No, that's okay. Last chance for questions. Of course, we'll hang out here for a little bit longer, but uh, I invite you guys to get some coffee or tea. And um, after this, after uh, in this room, we'll have um, novel and cutting edge analytics use cases. So we're talking about some basic stuff right now, but the next session will be kind of wild with some really weird and interesting use cases.